to the uh, school building committee meeting. I appreciate everyone showing up tonight. Uh, we'll go ahead and start the meeting at what do have? 7.01 and I'll ask the superintendent to call the roll. Mr. Luke Murray. Here. Mrs. Alita Hall. Here. Mrs. Amy Anzalone. Here. Dr. Ann Dixon. Here. Uh, Dave D'Agostino. Here. Christine Kennedy. Here. Uh, Kimberly Shockley. Here. Don Cowart. Here. Uh, Mr. Lucian. Here. Uh, Harold Sands. Here. Jason Martin. Here. Ms. Catherine Patno. Here. John Price. Here. And Lee Westall. Here. And if uh, Chairman Patno could please call the school committee roll. Uh, yes, I'll do the roll call. Uh, Ms. Catherine Patton. Here. Mr. Dave Florio. Here. Mr. Luke Murray. Here. Ms. Donna Colleen. Mr. James Pearson. And if uh, Council President Dixon could please call the roll for the town council. Certainly. This joint meeting of the town council with the school committee and the Coventry Building Committee will come to order at 7.02. Roll call. Ms. Ludwig? Here. Mrs. Shockley? Here. Mrs. Lima? Here. Mr. LeBlanc? Here. Mrs. Dixon? Here. Thank you very much. Uh, can we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I want to welcome everybody here tonight. I really appreciate you taking time to, to show up and, and learn a little bit about the building, uh, building project. I want to recognize our members of the legislative delegation, uh, Mr. George Nardone, Rep. Nardone, Representative Tom Norray, we have any other reps here tonight? So thank you for, for taking the time out, coming down and, and learning a little bit about this project. Um, Treasurer Magaziner is a little late in running. As you know, he is, uh, is moving around town and uh, moving around the state, I should say, and uh, a lot of different events. So what we're gonna do is actually get started with the presentation that we have for you. Uh, we have approximately 45 minutes and I'm actually gonna hop on my feet to get going. So again, I wanna thank the town council, school committee, school building committee, legislative delegation, elected officials, and the community who has joined us here tonight to learn a little bit about a very important project. This has been the culmination of approximately two years uh, this would be the 29th meeting of the school building committee. If you include the workshops, we're almost at 40 meetings. If you include all the updates, we're almost at 60 meetings. And if you include all my meetings, you're probably at 75. So it's, it's a lot of work and time on everybody's part. And I want to thank especially the building committee that keeps everything going and turning. Um, it's been a lot of work to this point, but this is kind of our rollout. As you see, there's a lot to look at. I want you to take a breath. Don't feel overwhelmed. There is a lot of information. As I said, this is a culmination of almost two years, uh, multiple reports. Um, so take a deep breath. Um, I also wanna recognize the, the School Building Authority members, Mario Carino and Dr. Joseph DeSilva. They're hanging in the back here, but are certainly available for questions. Um, if you want it from the source, they are the source on our state share who approved the necessity of school construction project. So you will get no better source. And we're, we're very thankful that they took time out of their day to come and join us. So I want to take everybody a little bit through the puzzles, uh, puzzle pieces here that really make up this project, because it was something that had to come together with the school building committee, but has included the town's council, the school committee, the residents. It was a process. And so it's important that you understand that process and through the decision making process that, that we went through because you really, in a first blush, may not truly understand the depth that we went to. And there's always a, a skepticism that comes, right? You look at a project, you say, why didn't they do this? 
Why didn't they look at this approach? Why didn't they look at this avenue or this financial strategy? And so tonight is about solving some of those questions. And the way we're gonna solve them is take you through a process from our building committee members perspective. Can all the school building members, uh, building committee members raise your hands, please? So this is the team who's gonna be answering the questions tonight. It's gonna to be kind of a round of robin format. I will ask some questions beyond there, especially the SBA. But we want them to convey some of the knowledge to you. I ask that you take notes. Um, I will not be entertaining questions only because we have about 45 minutes to convey this in information. I will be entertaining questions after the break, which we will have. We have plenty of refreshments during that break. Feel free to look around the boards. Our building committee members are our ambassadors. They're meant to talk you through some of the decision-making process and answer questions you have during the break. You have notepads in front of you. If I say something during my presentation that you have a burning question on, instead of raising your hand, I ask that you just put it on the note. We have a collector during the break. They'll come down, grab all the sticky notes, and we have a board here that's labeled for the different questions that we may encounter on this process. That is so, I understand you may have that question at the time and you may move on and forget it. I don't want you to forget it, I want you to log it. That will eventually be put into an FAQ that we will distribute to all of you. All of these questions will be answered and they will be posted. So I promise you, your question will be answered. So just have patience with me as we go through the process. So with that, I'll introduce the necessity of school construction process and the decision-making, which is our first part of the presentation. I do have notes, this is quite an extensive, I'm used to not having notes, so bear with me. If I see a little less animated than normal, it's just because, quite frankly, all, there's a lot of information to convey. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with Phil Conte, because he's our project architect, and I do want to recognize his team who had done all of this work, including this really nice light-up model, which I call the flux capacitor. Um, everyone knows me, I'm a big Back to the Future plant fan. Um, but Phil, can you talk a little bit, and feel free to stand, about how you were selected early in the process and when that was? Sure. So we, we started this relationship with Coventry by responding to uh, requests for proposals from A&E companies that had experience in the RISE Stage 1 and Stage 2 process. And that was almost uh, over two years ago that we have had to... Uh, honor of working with a very dedicated group. We had the opportunity to work in other municipalities and I can say that this is the strongest building committee that I've had the pleasure uh, with working with. Thanks, Phil. And that was early 2019. And Mr. Carroll, where are you? So right how, how do we get the funds to pay for that? So we were fortunate enough to get a ride grant for $150,000, which sure. shows their commitment to projects like ours. And, and that goes, uh, I'll recognize again, the school building authority that really got us kicked off in this process because without that, I don't think we'd be here tonight. So I really want to recognize them. Um, Ms. Alita Hall, where are you? That, my vice chair, she says I call her my co-chair. But um, when you started this process, what was your first meeting? What was your first interaction with any of this building effort? It was a session. It was uh, administrators and actually the Yeah, and there was actually three at that time, right? Be close, right? And there was about 20 people in each one of those charrettes. So that was that was before the building committee was even started. It was visioning. It was part of just really kicking off the process and kind of getting Studio J familiar with the project. So that was that was an important process to get us moving in the right direction. But ultimately, it did form a school building committee. And that was an intensive process in itself. So, so uh, Council President Dixon, can you talk a little bit about how the committee was formed and, and selected? Um, yes. Um, once we announced that we would be forming a Coventry Building Committee, uh, we asked members of the public to please supply uh, there were some recommended to us and other people just heard about the process and they applied directly. And the town council interviewed every single person who applied to be on the committee. And would you consider the applications fairly robust at that time, the skill set that you encountered? 
Um, at the time, uh, we were not really sure what the robust skill set was supposed to be, but we soon discovered what it is. Um, but RIDE had certain specifications. We had to have members from the school, uh, the school committee. We needed to have members from the school administration, needed to have representation from the town council and from the public. So we were very aware that we wanted to have a very, very broad representation from the community. Right, and we and we actually did get that, thankfully, um, and thanks to your efforts, really. Um, Chris, Christine Kennedy, you are a resident of the town. You've volunteered your time. You are not elected officials. Can you kind of describe the strengths of our committee? Yeah, I mean, and actually, before I, could could you share a microphone so that way because we are live streaming this. I just want to put that out there, and we are going to potentially take pictures. So if anybody has an objection, I meant to ask this to taking their photo. Please speak now, not to put you on the spot, but I just wanted to, I meant to put that out there. I'm sorry, Phil. You told me before the presentation I didn't do it. Um, so I'm sorry, Ms. Kennedy. Yeah, no problem. So our school building committee has a really diverse skill set. Um, so we're made up of construction managers, uh, trade professionals, school administrators, um, planners. Um, so we all bring a lot to the table. Yeah, and we actually have two construction managers. One of them is including yourself. Um, so, right. and we're, we're very fortunate to have them because they work for some of the largest companies in Rhode Island. Um, actually, is Shawmet in Rhode Island? I don't know if it's Massachusetts or Rhode Island. Okay. okay. All right. Um, Lee Restall, where are you, Lee? All right. I have a question for you. Um, so when you, were, when you were really getting engaged with the building committee, do you remember what the first thing we did is when we really kicked off? Well, the first thing I did was I realized I was the least qualified person on the committee. <laughs> this, is, this is the absolute most amazing committee I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Their, their qualifications are just out of this world. But I felt that what I could bring to the table was reality of what needs to be done, where do we put things, how do we support the people who are going to populate that building? And that's what I strove to do. You know what I like about you, Lee? You give a better answer than I would have given. I was like, letter of intent, right? That's the real answer, right? You submitted a letter of intent. And what is that? Well, well actually, I'll ask. Yeah. Mario, what's the letter of intent, briefly? Can you, can you just yell it out? All right, we're ready to start the process, right? And, and that really was just a kickoff to, to what we need to do later. Um, and John, uh, John Priest, I'll throw this one to you. Um, what was the other priority that we had as a committee? Uh, so the first big priority we had as a committee was the stage one report, I believe. Yeah, the stage one. And what is the stage one? Um, Does every, who knows what a stage one report is? Yeah, so there you go. So uh, the stage one report was really uh, identifying what the needs are in our schools. All right, what's the needs? We have to assess how, what our facilities are before we can start addressing the problems. So that's really kicked off that first process. And it sounds really sort of easy, right? Assess the needs. But when you're talking about multiple school buildings both built at multiple times with varying challenges, it becomes very, very difficult. But that is why we hired a very competent architectural team and they armed everything out to a subcontractor to do so, right? Great film. All right. So, uh, Christine, what were a few of the things that we performed as part of the stage one process? Do you remember a few? Thank Definitely you. the workshops, like Alita um, spoke about. Um, we did facilities assessments with the architects um, and we evaluated the needs. Yeah, uh, Phil, do you want to elaborate a little on that too? You were the architect, you were in the mix of it, so. We are identifying the needs. It's not just the facility condition needs. It's also the needs that you may have from a curriculum and programmatic standpoint that you're building in its current condition and not accommodate. It does either not facilitate what you need now or certainly not built how you want to teach and learn in the future. Good summary. Christine, would you figure, would you say that it was fairly comprehensive process, pretty robust? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so that resulted in this document, which is 800 pages. And this document has 
the assessment by a project management company that went through this, provided estimates, looked at the structurals, looked at the cracks in the walls, the mold, all of that very comprehensively. I did not do any of that. I have a full-time job. That is why I stayed on the sidelines and let them do their job. We as a committee let the, the architects do their job. But they came out with this assessment. It was submitted to RIDE. It is a requirement of RIDE. There is a reason. Um, Kathy, do you remember the stage one adoption process at all? I do. Um, we had to um, inform the bodies that we're going to have to move forward, the town council and the school committee, and keep them abreast of everything we were doing so that they could vote on whether or not they wanted to submit the stage one or not. And do you remember multiple meetings at that time? Us kind of there were several because there was so much. Well, you just said there were 800 pages in that report, so we had to synthesize that down to a manageable manageable amount of information that people could you know understand and get their heads wrapped around before we asked them to vote on it. Right. And Lee, do you remember what that vote was when we were all said and done? What the council had to had to vote on a resolution to submit? Do you remember if it was uh, unanimous? It was no? unanimous. It was unanimous. Well, school committee and town council were unanimous. We submitted that document. I believe it was February 17th of 2019. That was a major achievement for us. Unfortunately, it was something that kind of overshadowed a little bit later. Jason Martin, where are you? Yeah, what, what was that? Um, COVID. Yeah, um, COVID happened. Visit. That, was a, that was kind of a bummer. Uh, yeah, it, it, the good thing is, I guess, our application was in. And so the SBA had to still review it, even though we're kind of in the COVID mix. And we took a little bit of break during that time because, quite honestly, everybody took a break during that time. And we did reconvene. Um, we did reconvene in July of 2020, kind of re-kicked off the project because we had another hurdle to go through because we received a letter from Rye that said, you are approved. Your needs look good. Now you got to figure out a solution, right? So with that, um, Alita, what did we focus on during that time? <laughs> Schedule. on the scope. We looked at the stage one, we looked at the five elementary schools, the middle and high, and we started trying to figure out what the actual project needed to be. And who remembers the schedule of the building committee members? Come on, you got to raise your hands to this. Who remembers the leader's schedule? The Gantt chart, master schedule, Gilbane. Right? I asked for a schedule, I got a piece of art. So kudos to her. Um, and this mapped out the milestones, right? This, this told us the key markers. And we stayed on that schedule, Mrs. A, right? You remember that? We did. Stayed on that schedule. Every meeting, First John Fries would say, all right, here's where we're at. And we stayed along that schedule. We stayed on that path because COVID threw the big wrinkle. And, and the big wrinkle is that we couldn't have the in-person meetings. We couldn't do some of the things that we really wanted to do. But we made it work. Um, Lee, can you kind of describe what the stage two is? Because I'm saying stage two, but a lot of people, you know, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but what is it? Well, the stage two is where we're looking at what we need to do. What, what did we find? And now what, what do we need to do to improve our facilities in order to promote education in those structures? Okay. And, and so, John Priest, what were some of those initial solutions um or i should say what was it what were the types of things that we assessed during stage two so uh there were many things that we we looked through first uh the biggest thing i remember doing is actually going back through the stage one report looking at all the needs um we spent multiple visits i think we had five five site visits maybe to different schools looking at the different schools um and then we kind of went through multiple different variations of different type of projects we uh, were going to do. In particular, I think the middle school, we went through like 13 different variations of, of different types of projects we might want to undertake for that school. There's Jen Ludwig. Jen? Ah, there you are. Over in the corner. Um, you remember going on a, a site visit with me, right? And you, do you remember how long that was? You were it was very long. 
Perfect answer. I, I couldn't even stay for the rest of the tour. I, I had to go coach because we had spent several hours at the middle school. Do you remember what we had to do for that meeting because of COVID? We had, well, no, we had to record the whole thing on Zoom because it had to be interactive. So because of the state requirement, we had to have, we, we actually had a student followers around with a camera the whole time or phone on Zoom live. So if you ever want to go back to that, I mentioned that because it's recorded. It's all documented. It's there. Four hours of going school to school to school, documenting the, the, the problems and the issues and the challenges. So, and we, we have uh, State Treasurer Magazine are joining us, so I'll call attention. <laughs> um, so I'll zip this up. So I'm going to take it through the stage two and then I'll pause and then we'll introduce uh, Mr. Magaziner. So um, we looked at various project options, right? The solution. You know, what sort of things did we look at? So we looked at, uh, I don't know if this is on. Oh, uh, we looked at evaluated multiple scenarios. Um, we looked at different costs. We looked at different um, scopes. Uh, we looked at if we should build one level multiple levels to go up. What was the best bang for the buck? We looked at um, the camp itself as to coming ins and out. And um, all this could be found on our stage two report. And, and even before that, right? We, 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 before we settled on the middle school, right? We looked at a lot of other options, right? Absolutely. It's consolidating we, elementary schools, um, looking to see if we could get one campus with all the elementary schools. We looked at um, what the best sites would be. Uh, we looked at it. We did a lot of different things, um, you know, and again, then we looked at the renovations of each of them, what we could do because we wanted to get everything and for each school, want to do something for all the schools and, um, you know, and try to get something for our community as a total. All the kids will be able to get the, you know, uh, something out of this. Right. I'm going to put you on the spot. Alita. Yeah. You remember that process? Can you elaborate? What were some of the other things we considered just in general? I know we, I recall we, we had looked at different options together, right? So we had, you know, elementary school, one elementary school that might be more than the other elementary school. Can you describe a little bit of that? Yeah, and, and we ended up settling on the middle school because of a lot of different evaluations is, is basically the point, right? We looked at a lot of options. We exhausted a lot of options. We talked about it, what the community support may be. We looked at the actual conditions and we did what we were supposed to do. We looked at that stage one because there's a lot of information in that stage one. So I would encourage you to look at the stage one, which I have, it's online, I sent it in the packet, but it, it spells out that process. It also spelled out those various options you, you talk about. There's different pricing options, different scenarios. So we evaluated those scenarios and ultimately came to the conclusion that the middle school was the core project, but that we wanted to touch every single school. And with that, I, I know that time is sensitive. And uh, so I would like to introduce State Treasurer Magaziner. I want to thank him for, for coming. Uh, he has been a champion for schools and the school bond effort. And I asked him to speak tonight to a little bit about the the enhancement bonuses and some of the things that are available and his perspective on this unique effort. So thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll be brief, but I thought what I would do is just provide a little bit of context into how 
what you're discussing tonight fits into the statewide effort to improve school buildings uh, in Rhode Island. I wanna start by recognizing um, a number of uh, our partners in government who are here. Um, I'm joined um, by uh, the leaders of the school building team from RIDE, uh, Mario Carino and Joe De Silva, who do a fantastic job and are the real experts. Uh, I also, I'm not gonna recognize every elected official because I think we have all of them from the town who are here, but um, you know, particularly a shout out to um, uh, my colleagues at the state, uh, state house, Rep Nore and Rep Nardone, who do a terrific job. Uh, and I have to give a thank you and a recognition to a member of our uh, Rhode Island Treasury team, Councillor Kim Shockley, who uh, in her day job does a phenomenal job um, in our office as well. Uh, and to the chairman, uh, Chairman and Luke and, and all uh, Luke and all of the um, uh, the members of the school building committee. So I started out my career as a public school teacher. I taught third and fourth grade, and I saw from that experience that the quality of a school building has a direct impact on the ability of teachers to teach and students to learn. The building is not the only thing that matters, but it really makes a difference. And when you have a high quality learning environment, that makes it easier for educators to train students for the jobs of the 21st century. It makes it easier for students to stay alert. It makes it easier for students uh, to, um, I mean, even health outcomes. The research is clear when you hold everything else constant, when you hold demographics constant and everything else, the quality of a school building, the research shows, is directly correlated to reading levels, test scores, and even health outcomes like asthma rates in children. A higher quality school building means better learning outcomes and better health outcomes for students. And every student deserves to go to a school that is safe and warm and dry and equipped for 21st century learning. Uh, four years ago, uh, things really came to a head. We had a school facilities crisis in the state of Rhode Island, where we had school buildings falling apart all over the state. Then Governor Raimondo came to me and others and said, uh, we have a problem. It's a big, expensive problem. We need to do something. And she asked me to uh, co-chair a task force to develop a statewide school construction program. That program was passed into law by voters in 2018 and created a bonus system for school construction aid, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second. I wanna emphasize one thing up front, which is that neither I nor the team from RIDE or anyone from the state is coming in to tell the town what to do. This is a local decision. The decision about what projects to do, what to prioritize, these are local decisions and they should be local decisions because you know better than anyone what your students in your community need. Our role is to make it easier for you to do whatever it is you decide to do. And that's where the bonus system and the statewide school construction program come in. So, and I apologize if uh, some of you know this very well already, but I'm just gonna run through it. Um, prior to the program that was passed in 2018, the statewide school construction program, Coventry would have been eligible for about a 43% reimbursement from the state for any school construction project. What that means is that the state would cover 43% of the cost of a major project, but that state reimbursement would not come until after the project was over. So the town would have to, the school district would have to float a bond for the total project cost. And then afterwards, the state would basically pay 43% of the cost of that bond. So the town would have to put the whole thing on their credit card. And then afterwards, the state would pay 43% of the credit card bill every year. The changes we made were twofold. Number one, we put in a bonus system where for eligible projects, of which this would be one, the state share could increase significantly. And Coventry for this plan has preliminary approval for that state share to earn 20 bonus points, which means that that 43% state share would be a 63% state share. So that's the first big change, that instead of the state covering 43% of the project costs, it would now cover 63%, which is a significant difference. This is an $89 million proposal, as I understand it, thereabouts. Uh, so that's nearly an extra $20 million 
that the state would cover, actually more when you include the interest cost on the bond. The second change that we made was uh, to make it so that a portion of that state share would come not after the project was done, but up front. And so my understanding is that preliminarily, uh, this project has approval, this plan has approval for $8 million of the state share to come at the beginning of the project while the project is underway, as opposed to at the end, so the town doesn't have to put quite so much on the credit card. Importantly, all of these enhancements of state funding, both the bonuses and the what we call PAYGO, the portion that's paid up front, all of that expires soon. We couldn't make these bonuses permanent, in part because the state didn't have to make them, didn't have the money to make them permanent, um, and also because, uh, frankly, there was a desire up at the state house to encourage cities and towns to get moving because students can't wait forever for their school buildings to be fixed. So, some of these bonuses are going to expire uh, soon. Uh, the project has to break ground by the end of 2022 in order to earn some of these bonuses. And the rest of them, the project has to break ground by 2023. Uh, and then once you break ground, there's a five-year period over which the project has to be completed by in order to earn the full bonus amount. So as far as what type of project to do, which buildings to prioritize, what you want them to look like, what's important to you, those are local decisions. And the decision of whether to move forward at all or not is a local decision, and we're not going to tell you what to do. But what we are going to tell you is that there are significant extra state resources available, and those resources are only available for a temporary period of time. So if you don't move soon and you decide instead to wait five years or 10 years, it is unlikely that the state will cover as much of the cost. Um, I'm going to pause there. I'm happy to take questions, but I just want to end by saying um, what you are doing takes hard work and it takes courage, right? I mean, what you're talking about here is a big deal. This is a big program that you're embarking on potentially. Um, you know, I'm sure that every student and every parent and every community member has their own version of what perfect looks like. And so that means that there is no such thing as perfect for everybody. But I hope that you will continue to go through this process of coming together as a community to find that consensus on what your future of your school buildings look like. And we are here, RIDE is here, uh, to help you realize that vision. Um, every student deserves schools that are warm, safe, and dry, equipped for 21st century learning. That's just as true here in Coventry as it is everywhere else in the state of Rhode Island. And uh, we hope that with these extra resources, you will be able to make your vision a reality. I'm happy to take any questions, but I wanna thank you all for your leadership and thank you for your willingness to engage on this important topic. So thank you. Sure. So are you talking about the sort of the bonus system and what the extra funding could be for or just, yeah. 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 So I'd say a few things. Um, I think the benefits of modern school buildings and transforming school buildings, there's a few. So certainly there are upfront jobs, right, which is important for the state, upfront construction jobs. Even the projects that have already been approved in other communities that have already gone through their stage two proce uh, process and have already um, been approved by their voters, those projects from other communities collectively are going to put 20,000 people to work during the construction process. So that's no small thing. Um, there's certainly a health and safety benefit, right? I mean, we do not want students, particularly younger students, going to schools in buildings that are not up to fire code, that are not ADA compliant that have hazardous materials. And I'm not saying that's the case in every school building, but it's the case in many school buildings across Rhode Island. These are older buildings constructed with materials that are no longer up to code, so to speak. So health and safety is vitally important. But I think the most exciting benefit of transforming school buildings to make them modern is 
uh, the way that it will better prepare students for jobs in the 21st century economy. Um, I understand that, for example, part of the proposal uh, that you're discussing tonight uh, is to um, uh, expand uh, uh, science facilities at the high school, right? I mean, if you wanna prepare students for 21st century jobs, for jobs of the future, things like science labs and modern media, I mean, that's absolutely vital. Um, the jobs of the future that we're trying to attract to Rhode Island are jobs in technology and the life sciences and engineering. I mean, those are the jobs that pay well. And so having modern science facilities will give those students a step up, you know, when they graduate and they go on uh, to their next step. Career tech facilities is another example. Um, there's a lot of good jobs out there that do not require a four-year college degree. That's not the path for every student but you need high quality career tech facilities and that requires having facilities that are up to date uh, so that the experience that those students have in those career tech classrooms mirror what the jobs actually look like that they're preparing for. So to me, yes, the upfront construction jobs are a good thing for the state of Rhode Island. Yes, health and safety for students is absolutely essential and COVID made that even more apparent. But the most exciting thing for me is uh, with modern school buildings, you are better preparing the students of Coventry for the jobs that they will be going into uh, when they graduate. So um, those are some of the things that we've been talking about across the state and that we're starting to see borne out um, in some of those communities that were early movers uh, and have brand new facilities that are opening this fall. Well, that was an easy one. All right, an easy crowd. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah, interest rates now are at a historic low. I mean, there has never been a better time to borrow. Um, you know, the state of Rhode Island, we just went to market for state bonds um, last spring. We had an interest rate of less than one and a half percent borrowing rate. Um, when you float your bond, you will float it through a state agency called Rybec, uh, which exists specifically to help cities and towns issue bonds for school construction projects. They're also getting very low rates, sub 2% rates. Um, these low rates are not gonna last forever. Uh, already, you're seeing inflation tick up nationally, right? The cost of living is going up, interest rates are starting to creep up and so we really are at a unique period in history where interest rates have never been as low as they are now. It's not going to last forever. So yeah, I mean, if that is another benefit of moving quickly uh, is that at least right now, uh, the costs of bonding are historically very low, which will save on interest costs if you decide to move forward. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for your leadership and you're willing to engage on this. I'm excited to see what you come up with and to support you however we can. Um, I'll leave some of my cards behind. Anyone can reach out to our office at any time if you have any other questions. Um, and then also I know Joe and Mario are gonna be sticking around as well. And as I said before, they are the real experts who have been working with you and continue to work with you every step of the way. Um, but I'm very excited um, to see that this conversation is happening and thank each and every one of you for your leadership for Rhode, uh, for Rhode Island and for uh, particularly for the students of Coventry. So thank you everybody. So big thank you again to the treasurer for that presentation. I, I felt it was important to get the state perspective on this. I think there's many perspectives. I think good information leads to good decision-making. And so if we can keep that throughout this process, I think we will be successful. So I left off with the middle school. The school committee had voted as a committee to move forward with the middle school as a core project and have smaller but impactful projects at the other facilities. And so, Lee, as we work through some of the iterations, once we made that decision, can you tell me a little bit about how many iterations did we actually go through on the middle school alone? Did we challenge the architect? Did we push back? We went through quite a few. And the middle school has such issues. I've been sitting here listening to you talk, listening to Seth talk, a wonderful talk. And what I see the problem is, there are so many schools that are so far behind 
structurally that we, we really do have to address the middle school primarily. But I've got a daughter who's a teacher over there, and I normally don't talk about her. I'm, I'm here as myself. But she says, the fan is running in the hallway because it's wet out there and I can't hear the public address speaker and I know they're telling us something important. So we have issues there. And when I was in 70, 60 years ago, I graduated from Newton High School. There were three buildings. I found out after I graduated, I actually went into a building that my grandfather graduated from Newton High School. And when I graduated, they knocked down all three buildings and built a whole new school. And I thought, why would they do that? These were beautiful. Well, the tunnel going underneath the street was very difficult to traverse because everybody wanted to talk. And uh, you just didn't have time to move between the classes. And the design that we have for this middle school is absolutely incredible. We've worked it to death. We have other issues. We have a school with, that has one electrical outlet per classroom. How do you operate a class with one outlet? We have others with archaic lighting. We have others, isn't there one that has a well that needs to be addressed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, we've got all of these issues and this is this is an incredible time to step forward and address as many of these things as we can within the confines of what we can do financially in the town. And, and you know, I think it's important to raise a lot of good points, Lee, but if you look around at, at the things we've addressed, I encourage you to look at the boards during the break, talk to the architect about the things that we did do, we looked at, um, and not only here, but you know, Christine Kennedy, what else do we look at at other facilities? I mean, the core focus obviously here is the middle school, but it's more than that, right? Yeah. Um, one of the words I think that filtered around a lot was hive, um, which is high impact visual enhancements. Um, and, you know, a lot of that we looked at for across the elementary schools, especially, um, you know, it's amazing what a fresh coat of paint can do for a building. Um, and then, you know, over at the um, the high school, right, there was the um, accreditation issues we needed to um, address over there. Um, all of our existing assets need to be protected. Um, and then just so many critical needs, like Lee was mentioning, at all our facilities. We looked at all of those. Yeah, and, and you know, you mentioned NEASC, and, and many of us in this room were part of that NEASC debate during budget cycles, right, where parents stood up and said, I'm worried about the NEASC accreditation, I'm worried about the facilities being part of this. That was a community comment that we took to heart. So that was all brought into the stage two report. So the stage two, which is a voluminous document was created and we had some votes on that. So very briefly, Council President Dixon, do you remember the, the council voting on this and, and what the result of that was? Um, yes, the council was asked to um, vote on the uh, stage two presentation. Uh, they heard a presentation by you. We had many updates by you, excuse me, yet many up, updates by you at council meetings and we did vote uh, unanimous, unanimously to support the proposal. Chairman, Chairwoman Patnaud, did the school committee also vote unanimously on that document? Yes, we did, five to zero, no, no uh, negative comments. We were all for it. And um, seeing that you were the chair of the committee, you were a regular um, person on our agenda items um, to update the other members who weren't part of the committee. So there's a, there's a regular Johnny Carson out there. <laughs> uh, it was a lot of work because it, it took time, but it, educating I think was was helpful because we went to the council multiple times on this. We educated. So, Mr. Marshawn, I'll put you on the spot. Was that a voluminous document that we dropped off to you? <laughs> it is over two thousand pages. Um, feel free to look through it. Um, Phil, can you tell us some of the things that went into that document? And, and, you know, obviously the ride SBA requires a lot of this, right? They want due diligence. So can you just briefly describe that? Sure. When, when we're trying to document the solution, it's not just addressing the more safe drive components. It's addressing enrollment. It's addressing uh, the needs of the curriculum and the programmatic needs any structural deficiencies that we identified, site improvement, 
improvements. The goal is, and it is a rigorous process, but it's it's meant to be because we're asking for you to make a commitment and the state to make a commitment on a project that you believe will move Coventry forward, not only keeping students warm, safe, and dry, but also giving them the opportunity and, and taking advantage of the incentives that are available now. Thank you. All right. No, and, and that's the important thing. It's not just a bunch of pages to check a box. And we didn't look at it that way. I think this committee really took it to heart and we pushed. Lee's right. We pushed and we pushed. We went to meeting after meeting. This design is a result of, I believe, over 13 different designs that we looked at. And, and you know, some may like it, some may not. But I can tell you that we, we beat this up pretty bad. Um, Rick, you can attest to that because you were the poor guy. I had to do a lot of the drawings. Um, so then we, we formulated this stage two document. We had to submit it to RIDE. It was submitted to RIDE. And Dr. De Silva, you reviewed this, correct? Did you review this document? And, and can you just give us a, a brief thought on, on what you thought of our document when it, when it went in and you reviewed it? See, Phil thought you were going to say that was the best document stage two he ever saw in his life. Sorry. <laughs> Very by the book. Thank you. Thank you. And, and it's, it's no small feat, as we know. There were, were comments kicked back that, that Ride wanted more information. Uh, Mr. Carino, you also reviewed this document, the financials in it, all a part of it. Do you have any thoughts on, on that document and, and your perspective? That's a good answer. <laughs> My kind of guy right there. <laughs> You win the prize. I'm Jamie Barry. Dunkin' Donuts gift certificate at the end of the night. All right. So we're going to transition. I promise we're moving out of this. The point of this is to kind of convey, right? This is, I don't want to beat this up. It was a process. It was long. It was arduous. You get it. So we're going to move on to the project as approved. And I promise we will get to some financials and you'll have a perfect chance. To, uh, we'll be answering any questions that you have. So these are the projects, right? And, and they, they, they kind of, they're broadcast throughout Coventry, obviously different amounts. We have boards. This board is also up there if you want to take a look during the break. Um, but Kim Shockley, can you describe a few of the improvements at each one of these facilities? Because it's not just about the middle school. So yeah, I think you're taking care of a lot of the stage one drive at all the schools. Um, you know, that there's the Coventry Middle School, the Coventry Middle School. Oh, sorry. Um, work with HVAC systems. Um, there's gonna be a emergency generator. Um, so those fit into that category. And I'm trying to go to schools outside of the middle school because that's obviously gonna be the largest enhancement. But you know, Coventry High School is gonna go, um, as the treasurer was saying, we're going to be taking our old fashioned science labs and making them just more future oriented, be STEM labs. Um, and then on the other side, and probably where my son was the most exci excited, we're gonna take a gymnasium that practically can't be fixed anymore in its current um, state and, you know, improve that facility as well, which brings people into the schools. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the big things is deferred maintenance and no, that's not a knock on our physical plant because they do an outstanding job, but you can put a lot of floor polish on when there's no floor to polish, you have a problem, right? NEASC cited us multiple times in multiple different iterations for the gym floor. Sounds trite, but eventually you need a gym to run sports and activities. And if there's no floor left and it's not well maintained, and again, the maintenance is there. When you have no polyurethane left to maintain, that is a problem. So deferred maintenance on all of the facilities, painting, ceiling tiles, um, visual enhancements that we see that make a difference. HVAC, we know is so important for COVID. All of that is included in this project. 
which is extremely important. And parents should pay attention because no matter where you live in Coventry, what age group you are in, you are going to be touched by some of this money. So I invite you again to look at the boards, ask questions about what specifically would be at each one of these facilities. I want to touch on a couple elements of the middle school. One of them is the auditorium. And we take the auditorium for granted because auditoriums today aren't looked at as quite so critically and, and typically aren't reimbursed. So I want to ask Dr. De Silva this. Where are, as you saw in our document, we're keeping our auditorium. Do you think that was a prudent thought as part of the plan and why or why not? Yeah. And in and from that reimbursement perspective, would we, if we tore down that wing of the school and we wanted to build a new auditorium, would that be reimbursable? No, it would not. So that was strategic. We have a great auditorium. We want to keep that. That was a prudent approach to that solution that I think the building committee landed on is keeping the old core of the building, those common spaces that have value while eliminating those spaces that have really lesser value or no value because of the, the hurdles they pose on the educational environment. Um, Jason Martin, we're building a new cafeteria. Can you just explain what the thought process was on that? Well, I can assure you that the kitchen employees will be thankful because right now they walk pretty much the entire distance of the building because the kitchen is located on the complete opposite side of the cafeteria. So as far as a, a usable cafeteria, it was it's very segregated. It's not laid out very well. And to have the kitchen so far away, if there was ever anything that needed to be warmed up or, or, or they, they have to walk across the whole building, not to mention up and down ramps, they're rolling their carts and it just it doesn't make any sense the way that it is. And, and for those who want to, want to understand the financial impact of that, we have a thing every year that we have deficits in our lunch program. My daughter who goes to the school will not buy lunch. Why? Because you cannot stack kids in that cafeteria. So the kids instead choose to bring lunches instead of actually getting in line and waiting till the end of the period, maybe not eating, to actually get to the front of that line. It is a poorly laid out cafeteria. There's no way around it. Um, so that is something that we are addressing. The new cafeteria will be warm, it will be bright, it will be efficient, and hopefully we'll solve some of our school lunch deficit problem. And, and hopefully have windows so that, because right now it's in the middle of the building and it's very just dark and dingy, and we're hoping to light that up and give them something to enjoy their lunch instead of just sitting in the dingy dun dungeon. Yeah. And if anybody's been to the CHS, they know the addition part of the cafeteria, right? Very distinct. The whole cafeteria is very dark. That was when I was there. And now it's, it's kind of bright and eerie um, on the other side. So I want to also address a question I hear a lot, right? Why three stories? Why didn't you go one story with the middle school? How, you know, doesn't it, isn't it cheaper to build out than build up? So I have two very competent. Actually, Alita, what project are you working on right now? East Providence High School. Funded by state money. At, how much is that project? The construction cost of the building is $157,000. It's now 306,000 square feet, right? And you're the project manager for the entire project. Is that correct? Something like that, right? And Chris, Christine Kennedy, what project are you working on right now? Yeah, I am in downtown Providence on the Aloft Hotel. Right. Uh, it's a 175-bed hotel. Brand new ground up. Those two projects, did they choose to go up or out? Up. Up. What is the advantage of going up versus out when it pertains to this particular project? Feel free, either of you. And preferably with the microphone. <laughs> it's cheaper to go up than it is to go out. There is a lot of cost in concrete, roofing, MEPs. Um, it's just easier to stack up than it is to go out. Right. And so that was definitely a consideration. Alita, did you have anything to add to that? Thank you. No, no, for all of those reasons, and you do want to always minimize your building footprint. It's also easier from a custodial and maintenance perspective to not be sprawling more so than the, the stack features. So we were extremely fortunate to have two people in the industry who really guided that and made us understand that and the value of that. 
there was also value from an educational standpoint. Mr. Carr, can you talk to that? Right, so if you look at the existing building on the poster underneath the uh, display, you can see the building is really three different buildings stuck together. And so the section off to the right with the black roof is one part of the building that's separate from the rest of the building. And then you have that back section, which was built at a different time as well. So we have students spread out through all those locations. Some rooms are interior rooms with no windows, no natural light. Some rooms are exterior rooms. And uh, we have administrators scattered throughout the building. And so for first, before I get to the educational part, just for operations, it's very difficult for students to get from one side of the building to the other side in a quick, efficient manner that's not disruptive. So for example, if you're at the back end of that black roof section, and you have to make it to the gym, which is in the bottom left-hand corner of the white roof section, it's a solid 10 minute walk. Same thing for um, you to go to the cafeteria for lunch. So the, the layout of the building is not conducive to good operations, but it's also not conducive to, to good education. The environments within the classrooms are not, are not strong. There's not a lot of foot space, uh, um, footage for you to put anything other than desks. Um, and then when kids need to get extra help or support, and sometimes that is in class, but sometimes it's pulled out. The kids have no place to get pulled out to. So what happens is teachers and teacher assistants are pulling kids out to a location far away from where their actual class is. So, you know, you run a regular schedule and you have kids starting one place, going down the hall to another small space to get small group work and then coming back. It's loss of education time because you're transporting kids all over the place. When we first looked at the design that, um, we landed on, and, and by the way, the three-story design was not even, I think, in the first five or six we looked at. The three-story design didn't come in until later, but when Phil broke out that design and showed us how we can put breakout rooms and small group rooms right in the hallway outside of the main classroom, it provided an opportunity for kids to be able to break out, work in small groups, work collaboratively, work on projects, still be supervised, still be in centrally located to where their teacher is if they need assistance, and allowed uh, education to kind of work much better. And then to Lee's point, the technology is a big demand. All our kids are one-to-one, -one, which means we have Chromebooks that need to be charged. We have LCD projectors that need to be plugged in and we don't have uh, the right electrical, um, we don't have enough outlets. That's the bottom line to, to, to make all that work. And then that all impacts uh, the educational experience that kids need to have, especially like uh, the treasurer said for the 21st century. So there's no problems. No. Right. Okay. All right. But maybe our alternative strategy should have been investing in Fitbits. That's what I was thinking as you were talking. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to move uh, pretty swiftly over the next items because I think you all intrinsically know the value of this project. And if you don't know yet, be glad to talk to you offline about it. Um, have a cup of coffee. But I think that we know that people want to get to some of the aspects of this, including the financials. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, I'm going to skip over. What'd you skip me to, Phil? Financial strategy. Let's do that because I know that, uh, that out of all the things that I heard of the survey, I need to be responsive, right? And and I think what I heard most is, okay, great, you got a project, you agree on the project, everything looks good, you got to pay for it, right? So financial strategies. So we'll skip to this. And Mr. Sands, did you put together a team to assess some of these financial strategies from the school building side of the? Measure. Yes, I did. <clears throat> we had uh, six people that uh, joined the group, including myself. I'd love everybody to raise their hands because they put an inordinate amount of work into this. So could you please raise your hands? So these individuals are over the past month has put in a lot of time. Um, we asked Mr. Sands to kind of start looking at the numbers. Are we correct with our numbers, right? And, and as you work through this numbers, Mr. Sands, what, what did you find out? Who did you coordinate with? What was the process? Well, at first, we, at first the group really had to understand um, what was pay go? What were the incentive bonuses? What could we really expect from this bond? And as we, as we worked through those, then, then, then we wanted to find out, okay, do we have the right numbers? Are we working with the right people? So then we talked with Mr. Carino, Carino <clears throat> Mario, and we also talked with Steve, Steve Massareno, the uh, town bond finance advisor. 
And with the two of them, we were able to come together with a, a, a plan that really sort of put everything into place so that we could really look at the numbers and make sure that all the numbers were correct. And, and just to be clear, these are numbers from what, we, what we're starting at now, right? So we have an approved project at a certain amount. We want to make sure that if we're going to be projecting those costs over time, we have the correct numbers, which my understanding was we maybe didn't have some of those initial numbers. Is that correct? That is correct. I mean, we, we were looking at 20% uh, 20% incentive bonus. Uh, when we actually really looked at it, it really wasn't 20%. It, we had to come down to 15%. Yeah, and and you know there are just so everyone understands, and and Mario can attest to this. Tell me if I say anything incorrect, um, but there are some energy bonuses that are available. So if we approach the project in a strategic way, we could still recapture another up to four percent. Is that that a fair summary? So I see shaking heads. So that's a good thing. Um, so we still have ability to raise this fifty-seven point eight percent threshold higher. But we don't want to, we want to be honest with the community, right? It's a cost benefit analysis. I have talked to Phil about this. He feels confident that at our current rating of 66, score of 66 on the Energy Star rating, we could boost that significantly higher. And with that comes not only operational cost savings, but also drives down our cost of project. And that's very important. John Priest, you are a key member of this committee, right? So I'm gonna bring up some numbers here. These are the numbers that you presented to myself in the school building committee. Can you talk a little bit to them about the base rate and also what is a little bit about, and, and Mr. Magazine alluded to it, our pay go amount and what that means. Yeah, so uh, first the pay go amount. The pay go amount is basically what the state is gonna give us up front to start this project. Um, that's $8 million. Uh, roughly $8 million. So that's where um, we have the project cost of 89 million and that drops the bond to 81 million, that upfront $8 million pay go. Right, and then you have a total project savings of approximately $20 million. Can you, obviously you see the difference from the base rate, but can you just review that a little bit for me and, and your thought as you went, as the committee or the, the team went through this? So yeah, the, the total project savings of the $20 million, is that what you're referring to? Um, so that, that total uh, savings of the $20 million comes in uh, both from the PAYGO as well as uh, the other incentives that we're getting from the state. Um, the so to summarize, maybe. It's a sale price. Is that kind yeah, of yeah? There you go. Yeah. So, so that's as, as Christine. Christine, uh, there you go. Use your turn. And he said, "That's that's, that's the a sale, sale price. price. That's right? what the state is giving us. Yes. Um, that that is the money that um, the, that we're getting from the additional um, money that we're getting from the state, as as um, the secretary Magazina had stated that." extra 15 to 20 percent um, from the from the that the state is giving us above and beyond what we'd usually get for a school building those bonuses and I, I do want to and that goes away soon and it does go away yeah 2022 2023 those those incentives go away which essentially wipes that bottom line out 20 million dollars of, of principal and interest so this is the reason we say now is the time. Now is the time to at least think about it pretty seriously, whether this should be moved forward as a community, because I can tell you one thing, the needs will not go away. They're going to get worse. And we all know that, right? So a little bit of food for thought on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is, and, and I want to thank the committee for this because we did discuss it with Phil, is that not every facility qualified for that 15%, right? But how do we approach that? Everyone remember from the building committee? Why did we get 15%? Alita? That's right, like all state, we bundled, right? We bundled that. Yeah. So if you if one of your project qualifies for the higher amount and you submit in one shot, you get the whole enchilada. So that's an important point because we could have easily segregated the projects, gone for less, 
well, this could easily be a 5% incentive. But we strategically looked at that and formulated the project based around these incentives. That doesn't mean we included things that shouldn't be done. That just means we thought about how we package the product. And that means a difference. If this it could save this community substantial sums of money. Can we go to product? So this is what you really want to know, right? I've had a lot of requests for this about what is the cost to an average taxpayer? Well, we've run some of the numbers, right? And so John, do you want to talk to this a little bit? Sure. So basically um, to pay off the bond, uh, the town is going to need a one-time 3.45% interest uh, tax increase. Um, and this will allow us, uh, allow the town to pay off its share of the bond. Um, depending on your home value, we have the different uh, estimates of what you're gonna have to pay, uh, what, what the increase to your tax is gonna be on a yearly, weekly, monthly estimate. Right, I think it's important, and we've all said this as a committee, we wanna be honest with the public. We're not trying to sell something. The project should sell itself, right? When these kids go into school, the kids should sell it because they come home and they talk about the leaky roof or whatever was impacted that day. Um, I think this is something you can take back to your constituents if you're a council person or a school committee member. I think it's something that you have to be honest with. What is the value? What is the affordability component? Now, we don't know all of the equation. We've come at it from a school building committee perspective, right? We know what the project costs. We have numbers that we know what the tax rate is. We can calculate, we did calculate, as the Sands calculated, what the impact would be on the average homeowner. There are still many questions to be answered, and we know that. So that's where we get into next steps. And really, what are the next steps? Well, it comes with collaboration, right? Community and communication. Right. Collaboration between the town side and the school side. We are all one town. Our finances flow through each other. And so we have to sit down as a team to figure this out, right? And that's really what we're asking for at this point. You've seen the amount of work put into this project. What we're asking for is the opportunity to come and make an earnest effort to see if this community could move forward with this project. It is essentially important. All of this could go away like that. And it really, it would be a shame because there's too much that's been done, too much thought process, and it, these incentives will extinguish. We're looking at community. The school building committee understands the value of educating the community and not pushing the project, not selling the project, but stating the values of the project. This is the project that we want, we feel is the best for the community, We'll explain it. We're the ambassadors, right? We're already working on these efforts. We have a marketing team, or I will say a communications and outreach team. It's not really marketing. I, I've actually refrained from saying that, right? I just said it. Yep. But that is led by Mr. Cowart. Mr. Cowart, how many outside community members do you have on that team? Uh, most of the team are, um, well, they're all residents, but most of the team are not from our school building committee. Uh, they're, they're residents who um, have been involved. We have um, business owners. We have um, people who attend meetings who are very involved in our community, who know the issues that our community faces, both on the town and school side. We have former marketing and PR and communication specialists. We have uh, technology people. So we have a really wide range of people working on this information and a communication plan so that when people have questions about this project, we're giving them the answers, uh, the right answers in the right way in using methods that they are comfortable using, whether it's social media or emails or you know, YouTube broadcasts, whatever people need, we wanna make sure we give it to them so that any questions they have are answered. Thank you. And, and Mrs. A, you are in charge of another team, uh, Logistics. Uh -huh. So uh, how many of the school building committee members are on that team and how many are from the public? Uh, there is one member from our school building committee that is on the team, but then there are six members from the community and um, there are a few administrators because our job, the logistics group, is to take the information, the great information that the 
marketing team use um, puts together and how are we going to get that information out? How are we going to schedule those informational sessions? And that's in addition to the finance team, which I would expect is going to continue on, right? The hope is to, to continue to meet with the town side and, and continue on with your efforts and come back next month. I have scheduled with Council President Dixon an update. Hopefully that'll be a joint update to figure out the other components of this plan. I'm not saying all things will be answered at that time. We have time. That's why I said take a breath at the beginning. We have a few months. We are looking come November to have a vote. And all we're asking for is an honest vote. Up or down on the project to move forward to a ballot in, in March for the public to weigh in on their perspective. And so there's a lot of dialogue that needs to happen. We know that. Um, and that's okay. We welcome the debate and we hope it's rigorous. Uh, with that, hopefully you have plenty of post-it notes. Um, I'm going to zip my part up. We are going to take a break for 10 to 15 minutes. I invite you to look at the boards, grab something to eat. We have a runner who's going to pick these up. So just leave them on the front and we'll, we'll categorize them and get them all set while you, uh, while you take a break. Thank you. Well, recess at uh, eight twelve is what I have. So we'll be back here at let's call it eight twenty five. We'll do eight twenty five. Thank you.
Uh, we've rounded up the questions. We have categorized them. We are going to answer them as many as we can. And then I think what we'll do, Phil, is maybe answer a question off the board. And then if, if somebody's got maybe a hand raised or something, I don't want to just kind of just be one way with the, the question. So we'll kind of weave these into the narrative. And if you have a question that you want to share and you have a post it on the board, just let us know because we can take it down. So um, so we'll start, you know, obviously financial impact has a lot up there. So if you want to start with financial impact. Uh, and as Luke mentioned, we will try to answer these as properly as possible. Certainly, this is a great basis for an FAQ. So thank you for taking the time to write these down. So the first question is, what is the total bond indebtedness to Coventry? So what is the total bond indebtedness to Coventry? I'll pitch that on Harold. I guess that means is, who, who asked that question? Don't be ashamed. They apparently left. I mean, we don't have to answer that question. But as far as I'm assuming, as far as this project is concerned, what would be the total bond indebtedness? Sixty-five million dollars. Um, what do you think they're asking, Dave? Including interest. So if that is the question, then that requires the town to come to the table, right? We talked about collaboration. We, we talked about finances from our side of the equation. Would that be fair, Harold? So, so that is something that comes September, stay tuned. We hope to have that number. Now, obviously I can look up the finance book, the audit that was just done and I can find that information, but I'm not gonna do it right now. So, um, so we'll hold that question, all right? Again, as Luke mentioned, this is the beginning of this collaboration and cooperative effort. <clears throat> These questions are going to be great for us to move the conversation forward very quickly and uh, robustly. All right, the next question, can we afford the tax increase? So again, can we afford it? I'm going to, I'm going to defer this one, right? That's a loaded question in and of itself, right? Can we afford it? That's not for me to decide. That's not for the building committee to decide. We baked up a project that we feel is the best project and the best value for the community. It's really up to the community side if it's affordable for them. What we did do is we provided some numbers tonight to act as a tool, right? And I received this from multiple members of our elected bodies. I wanna know what the impact is on an average homeowner, right? We've told you it's a cost of a Netflix subscription for the month, right? Every month. And that's not compounding. You know, once you build that into the budget, it's about $2.5 million, Harold. Right. So once you build that into the budget, you are paying on that bond. So for the cost of a pizza, the Netflix subscription, some people may say that is, that is out of the range and that is their choice. But as far as affordability, we'll talk to the town side and also get what's affordable from the municipal side and their budgeting and where they sit. So to be continued. Next question was, if the town cannot support an $80 million bond, are there opportunities to scale down the project? So we looked at some of those opportunities and you know, I'll invite any building committee member to help me answer this question. If you want, raise your hand. But I would say that we did look at other opportunities. When we, when we did it, I strategically didn't give the committee a budget. I said, focus on the project, focus on the needs, right? I knew the ceiling. I had talked to the former town manager about this and we had talked about finances, but we developed something we felt met the need. But Phil, what would a reduction look like? So there's some sense that this is too expensive of a project by some. What would a renovated middle school look like, which presumably be more affordable? Sure, so it, it, it's important to keep in mind, and many of you may know this, but this used to be a high school a Bogue Tech High School. This used to be a high school, a Bogue Tech High School. Many of the spaces are inappropriate for new century teaching and learning. This is the approved project. It's important to keep in mind that it's not only the architecture of the building, obviously the curriculum and the program behind it, but also the, what we, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment all of those pieces that make those spaces work. And unless a major renovation and addition is not 
like new, you will not be eligible for reimbursement for all of that furniture, fixture, and equipment. And if the if the curriculum is 70% of the success of the school and the building is 20, half of that 10 is going to be in the FF and E. And we would not want you to miss out on that full reimbursement. So this is going to need to be a like new renovation to be reimbursed for the furniture, fixtures, and equipment by the state. And, and I, I also want to talk, you know, really briefly, I know that some of you may still say, well, yeah, but, right? We get the reimbursement, so what? If we can only afford 40 million, 20 million, 10 million, what does that mean? Look back in history. 20 years ago, we already put money into this middle school to move a cafeteria that is now the worst cafeteria in the district. That was a bad decision. Money driven. Money driven decisions are bad decisions most of the time because you're not focused on the priority, which is education, curriculum, the spaces. So I would shoot back to say that you're better off not wasting your money on an old building to core it out and still have Guam, still have administration issues, still have all the other things. Nice new classrooms paint on the wall, but doesn't lay out correctly. We all know that that was a form of that wing, which we call Guam, was a form of vocational technical wing. It was never built to be a middle school. So we are building here a middle school, which is what we should have done 20 years ago. And I can tell you, we'll be looking at it again in another 20 if we don't do a significant renovation here. And that is the discussion, correct me if I'm wrong, committee members, yes. that we did have. Mm -hmm. yep. Next question, uh, financial impact, your slides say 3.45 tax increases this one time. Why is the half a million housing aid not listed here? So first question, 3.45. Harold, do you want to take that? I mean, I can answer, but... Another voice. Is it one time? Yeah, it's the, the 3.1, 3.45 is a one time um, tax increase. But it, it stays on. It so stays on. So that's the important differentiator. It one time, just like our annual tax levy, it goes on once, it stays. So every year you're, you're paying that 3.45, you're just not paying an additional amount every year. So it's. Um, basically the Netflix for every month for the next 25 years. Right. right. That's a good analogy. You're locked into that Netflix for 25 years. It won't go up, right? Netflix goes up, unfortunately. But, but that will not go up. It's built into the budget. Uh, Josh Clements. I don't know if you have a microphone. Uh, can someone just share a microphone? Come on up to the table next to... Uh, you just mentioned kind of wasting money, right? In one way is, you know, wasting money through energy um, or energy costs rather. So earlier you, you mentioned uh, the energy star rating and it, you mentioned the number 66 and I'm not familiar with that, but I guess the, the general question is how do we see energy efficiency being incorporated in these, these renovations? And then do we anticipate, uh, you know, significant utility savings over the lifetime of this, uh, these renovations? So, I'll let Phil answer one part of it. I'm going to answer the first part, which is from a committee perspective, we've talked about things like solar canopies. We've talked about things about energy efficiency. Some people, you know, they think air conditioning is just going to cost more money. The truth is it would probably cost less. If anyone's been to our schools now for the IEP programs, 504s, we have to have individual air conditioners in the rooms. And that just dumps cold air out the windows. The heat in the summer, the windows. So... I'll let you take the, take the, the only thing I, I can say to that is it's not uncommon for us to increase the size of the building, add air conditioning, and still reduce the energy costs between the efficiencies of the systems, super insulate the building, and reduce the electrical load, LED lights, et cetera. And then take out all those things that are sucking energy out of the building, like air conditioners, fans running on the floor, dehumidifiers, et cetera. You know, Jason has done a really good job of being a steward of what you have. Uh, but even then, all systems reach an end of useful life. And what comes next is technology that is far advanced and used properly. We can reduce the cost even in a builder that's bigger with air conditioning. 
Does that answer your question? Right. Hey, Luke, um, there, was yes. a, there was a second part of my question oh. <laughs> on that sticky. Oh. I'm sorry, you're right, correct? Another sticky or? Uh, no, same one. Okay. Oh, oh, wait. I'm sorry, I didn't read this question yet. It was the housing aid. Oh, I'm sorry. I blew what, over what? that with the, the energy efficiency, I probably. So when you talk about housing aid specifically, what do you refer, like we get, so we get normal housing aid for a lot of projects. We have to submit the ride to qualify for them. So like HVAC improvements that are going on now, right? We submit for projects along the way and we get base housing rate for that. That does come to the town because it flows through the town. And as far as this housing aid, the town has to pay the bonded debt. So any reimbursement from the specific housing aid would go to the town to pay off that bond. Does that answer your question? So is there is there an assumption here that um, anything that's coming through housing aid from the state would be used on this then? Versus, for example, what we use it for today on different town expenditures. This would be dedicated to the bond payment, which is for schools. Unless the town wants to levy more taxes and, and raise more funds. It all comes out of the same pot. So money, the check comes in, $2.5 million, and it gets paid. John? We, we kind of talked about this during the sure. finance uh, meetings. Do you have the mic on? Oh, that's we okay. Thank you. Sorry. We talked about this during the finance meetings a lot. The, the aid that the town now gets, the housing aid the town now gets, the town is still going to keep, uh, it's not going to be affected by, um, by this bond here. So I don't know if that's the question you were asking. Do you, Mario, do you want to weigh in on this? Because you're, you're the source yeah. here. So would you mind... Yeah, if you, if you would, um, would you share a mic with him? I think it's important. We're on video, so everyone can hear. Thank you. A, a couple of things to consider. So as the treasurer mentioned earlier, this is going to be issued through Rybeck in order to get your interest reimbursed. And per state law, uh, your housing aid payments first get sent to Rybeck until you actually make your debt service payments, and then they're released to the town. So there's a implicit um, agreement here that you know housing aid is released after you make that service payments and it, it's actually presumably going to those payments. The other thing um, I think you mentioned all housing aid payments. So we actually provide breakdowns. So Coventry has prior bonds that are receiving housing aid. You might have, uh, I think this year you have like an emergency project that gets aid. So that's it's all broken up so that you know different pools of money are funding different projects. Does that answer? So are you referring to maintenance? Let's, uh, like the main, because there's, there's a difference in the maintenance requirement. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, no, I'm, I'm talking about the housing oh, aid. Right. I just want to know what the assumptions were that it, it fully goes back towards this bond versus anything else first. So anything else that we would have normally needed for this, we're going to have to, to um, ask for above and beyond. Yes, because you have to pay the bill. So, so I'm assuming that $2.5 million bill comes in for the bond. The town's going to have to pay it. They're going to take in the money and pay it out of their accounts. As far as using that money anywhere else. Like how we would use it today, for example, when that money comes in today and what we budget that for, whether it's town or school. Well, even the past bonds, you're, you have a debt. You have a certain debt you have to pay. So I look at it as inflow outflow. That inflow comes in, you have an outflow. So does, am I not explaining that correctly? Like, I, I think the that? answer to her question is just yes. Um. Yeah, I, I think it is. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe that's what I'm missing here. Yes, it, the assumption is that it will be used to pay the bond from the school side because, you know, the money comes in, it, the bond gets paid. Uh, along with that, though, and I will touch on maintenance, one thing, because Mario and I have had this conversation, right? We do claim some of the bond interest towards our maintenance requirement, is that correct? Yes. And could some of this interest be allocated towards that same maintenance of effort requirement? Yes, and so one of the important things to note is without this, right, it becomes very difficult for the school department to actually meet that 3% requirement, which in a, in, a, in a way it's like by not approving this, you, you're actually subject to losing potentially a million dollars a year of, of future housing aid if you're not 
appropriating funds for capital projects. So it's got a, a double benefit that by doing this work and then paying the interest on it, it should get you over that 3% at least uh, for the next 20 years, perhaps you might be okay. Dr. De Silva. Yeah, I'd like to just, one of the very first questions, can you afford this? Maybe the question is, can you afford not to do this? Um, and, and I think Mario is uh, the director for me. I've just, um, you know, um, provided a reason for that. And, and so I don't want to go too far down that road, but I think it's a great point is that we do have this maintenance uh, uh, requirement. It is going up to 3%. We are not covering that now, but this could count towards it. Um, and a lot of the, the projects that we're identifying in here are on a capital plan. So if we were to get money that flows through the town, typically we'd be doing these projects anyway. So this sort of sets us up, and this is the, uh, this is this conversation we had, correct? Is that this really sets us up for the next 20 to 25 years because we're covering that. I mean, we're, we're attacking all these projects instead of drip and drabs on leaky roofs and, and doing things that really don't affect education, which is a big core part of this project. We're really setting ourselves up for the next 20 years and taking care of that educational component and getting the community will because instead of people saying, well, we gave them money and they fixed the HVAC and now it's broken again because of the deferred maintenance, we're really taking it a big slice at it. And so that is another reason why we took a, such a big swing on this one. So. Why, when does it go to 3%? This year, I think, is it? Next year, okay, sorry. Thank you. Remember my statement. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Blank. Just a, a follow-up, um, going back to the, the one-time increase comment of 3.45. Um, I, I know on the slide, we say tax increase by 3.45, but what's the dollar amount? Total? Yeah. Uh, I mentioned it, 2.5 million, I think is what we're trying to raise to cover the, the debt and interest after the reimbursement. So in uh, effectively the year that uh, a hypothetical bond got approved, there would be an increase of 3.45%. Would it be your opinion that the school committee and the town council have a 0% level funded budget that year? Because if not, wouldn't residents be paying north of 6%? in one year, potentially? So I think that's a fair observation. I think that's a fair comment. I don't have an answer to that tonight because the truth is we need to get with the town and figure this out, right? This is something that can be talked about. I think it should be talked about. Oh, 100%. Right? It's the whole pie, mm -hmm. right? So we're not adverse to that conversation. We've had that conversation in house and, and we welcome everyone to the table to have that discussion. What does this mean as part of a total concept? Right? And if we're committed to it on all levels, what is that? What will make it work? So I'll table that idea for now, you know, but we will come back to you in September, end of September, hopefully, and have some answers along those lines. So, and that, I guess my last comment, I just want to make, so it's 2.5. That's not one time, it's 2.5 times 25 years, essentially, is, is, is the a, total cost. I just, uh, I don't like the one time increase comment, that's all. Yeah, and, and as we said, that's Netflix for 25 years. So, but we don't want to give the impression, I, there's a lot of confusion in the community. I've answered questions, they think it's compounding. You know, over and over, you're getting whacked with that that for the next 25 years, and that's not the case. You get you get the inflow of what you need. It's like a mortgage payment. You know, I get a bump up in my salary, I can cover my mortgage, I'm good. Now, if my mortgage goes up, but in this case, it's locked in, it's a fixed rate. So, uh, Ms. Lima. I just want to go back to the, cost of the project and you were talking about how you consider being being less. Um, so are you saying pretty much that it's 81 million or bust? Um, yes. And there's <laughs> there's really no room at all. So I'll push this back to SBA. Uh, Dr. De Silva and, and Mario, uh, if we don't want to go forward with this project right now, can we just can we submit a new project and within the next six months and, and move forward? You have to begin all over again. All of this has to be rewritten. Stage two has to be completely redone. So two years from now, we'll be having that discussion. And one other, yeah. one other thing, by that time, PAYGO will have already been encumbered to, to other communities uh, and all those and, uh, bonuses <clears throat> will expire. So the bonuses will expire and PAYGO will also expire. Which is a relation to increase the project cost for the same project. If you pay more, for example, this in 
a few years would be a hundred million. If you wait, and then you know, same thing. Yeah. Four years. The future costs the money. So we're seeing right now construction costs so, increase. So what? So what is going to be discussed at, at a negotiating table when it comes to the tax increases between the town, the school, this building committee? When it sounds like it has to be the city one thousand eighty one million or bust, and we hear from the school department this year during the budget process that they plan to ask for the maximum for the next couple of years because they have a structural deficit, and we've had level funded budgets. It sounds like there's no room anywhere to budge. So where do we go from here when it's this project or bust, and the town and the school need increases no matter what? I think it's a fair comment. You know, I think you should be pushing those questions, right? I push those questions all the time. I don't know the answer, right? The project did $81 million. The early indications that I got when I talked to the town manager is that is potential debt capacity of the town. We're project driven. So the real question is, are we gonna to collaborate to figure this out, right? Is there a path forward? Is there a way we can get creative? Is there a way to leverage money? We have debt falling off potentially, right? Can that debt be used? Maybe not. Maybe we have to look at leveraging housing aid. Look at the whole pie. Are we counting, counting maintenance of effort, right? We're going to have to pay, uh, we're going to have to pay the maintenance requirement anyway. Eventually, somebody's going to pay it. All money throws through the town, comes to the schools. We allocate it as a school committee. The taxpayer pays for it. So all good questions. I don't have the answers, but we will. I promise you. But come to the table. Come, the town comes to the table with us. We're going to work through it. I didn't say it wasn't going to be painful either. There's going to be pain involved. I have a couple of questions for the audience. So, you're talking about $25 million possible increase. What is 3% of that money? Is that going to be for what? Harold, do you have that money? It was $1.8 million under the 2.5, right? Is that correct? Uh, okay, so I think memory serving. Well, actually, Ms. Mills, if you also have that, uh, I believe it's one8 this year and it's going to be upwards of $2.5 million. Okay. That's it. No, just just in case you happen to know it, I know you have dealings with it as well. So, That's just my ballpark, 2.5. ballpark two point five. Correct. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just throwing it out there. The uh, the town where I grew up actually just approved the new middle school. And they actually had two votes, one for project approval and another for a debt exclusion. So they wouldn't have to level fund their annual budget. So just throwing that out there. So they had two votes, just so everyone hears it. One was for debt exclusion. So you mean that, that year they didn't levy or what? No, they, they still had their normal process, but that three point in our case, three point four five wasn't counted. Oh, uh, towards your yes. And there is an exemption if we're worried about 4%, but I think it's a fair comment, right? We understand that having a ballot referendum in a March with a potential tax increase is going to impact June, right? Potentially, okay, June. So what does that look like? I don't know. Um, we also have alternatives to levying that tax. Do you do it all up front? Do you do the appropriation over time? There's risk involved with that. That is a discussion we can have. I think it's beyond tonight's purview, though. But I, I'm, I'm, I, I can tell you that we, with, with, so we've had, I will, I will talk to uh, Council President Dixon here. We've had leadership meetings, actually. Uh, Ms. Lugwood was in on early on. We looked at the bond impact. We looked at some preliminary numbers early on. We continued to look at those numbers, and we will continue to look at those numbers and figure this out. I'm checking. 8.53, wow, questions real quick. All right, let's let's start zipping this up. Well, and, and we may not get to all of these, but I promise they will resurface. I'm going to call, the, just so everyone understands, I'm going to call the meeting at 9, but if you want to stay, we'll answer questions. But I add on the agenda that we would zip up the meeting, so. So financial impact, what assumption is principal costs after housing aid? Same for interest. Are you assuming no housing aid to town? Yeah, I think it's the same question. We can bank that one. Next. All right. Uh, why is 25 year bond at 4%? Seth said Ryback is less than 2%. So they calculate four as an average. Um, yeah, he's right. May, we may get a better interest rate 
But I think, and, and Mario, you can comment on this as well, the current climate may not be the climate a year from now, so we want to be conservative. Is that the general? Yeah, that's a good, yeah. good summary of it. So, the windfall, you got a better rate. I mean, the hope is, listen, I just floated roadway bonds at less than 1%. I floated my lighting bonds in Warwick for less than 1%. Ryback's a little higher just because of the nature that they service public facilities. I would expect that we would get a lower percentage, but we want to be interested. We'd rather, uh, what is it? Overshoot and underdeliver? No, that's not the one. <laughs> <laughs> underdeliver. No. Wait a minute. Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> All right, I think there's a good question here. Is there an opportunity to consider restructuring this bond to include town infrastructure improvements, i.e. roads, to make this an easier sell to voters? So that is a discussion we can have. And I think it is one. I, I, I Many know I floated this idea out. I think, you know, from my personal aspect, I live in the community too. This is all volunteer time. Everyone knows that. I have a, I have a day job. I, I would love for my road to be repaid. I would love for other things to be done in the town. Um, but that has to be both sides of the equation, right? Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? I don't know. But the outcome would be glorious, wouldn't it? Have, a, have all these new facilities, including schools, and feeling like it's one town? I think that's a goal maybe we could shoot for, but can't answer that tonight. Collaboration. All right. Um, what if we spent the our state aid on annually up to this point? What we have, what we have, what have we sent us? I think, to? I think it does. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's already been. That was my question. Like, what are we spending this money on now that we wouldn't be able to spend it on any longer? Um, I think we answered that one. And that one was answered. Right. Okay, perfect. Uh, where does this middle school concept uh, rank in affordability compared to the other 12 options considered? I'll, I'll kick that to you, Phil, because you knew the other options very well. And I think they were square footage wise, very comparable, yeah, just the layout. It's, it's, it's important to keep in mind here that you did not let the cost drive the decision. This is a generational opportunity that you have for the next 50 years in Coventry. And to make that decision simply based on economics alone is not what the whole system was set up for. That's not why these gentlemen are here tonight. So. Uh, I had an idea of where the costs were. They were all about the same in terms of square footage and size. Yeah, just so everyone understands, at that phase of a design, it's impossible to estimate everything, right? So there are standard numbers that are provided. And Dr. De Silva, feel free. I just want to say the reason that the Council of Elementary and Secondary Education approved this project it was because this was the most prudent, educationally sound solution of all the options that were presented and you all exhausted many options. Uh, that was part of our review. Thank you. And I think that speaks volumes, right? I would just caution this messaging of don't let money drive decisions. I don't know that I would use that in communicating with the public because especially in my district, um, money drives what they do every single day if they're gonna pay their bills. So this message you're, I understand what you're trying to say, but this message of, we can't let money drive our decisions. People would love to have that opportunity, but they can't, especially so, in, a, in a pandemic. So, so please, and I yeah. say this to the marketing committee too, if you know, with this move forward, don't, please don't use that. That's, that just feels insensitive to, to people who make payments on, on a check to check, week to week basis. That's a good comment and take it to heart, Tom. No, it, it's totally, you're right on the mark, right? And I actually, I cringe when you said that because I was like, because <laughs> I'm a taxpayer too, man. I want you to be bargain focused, but here's the real reality. I would guess based on Jacobs, all the things that we need, Council President Dixon, you advocated for the CHS. We actually bumped up the budget on that because of that, right? But the need is much greater than $89 million. It's $250 million. That scares people. <laughs> But we already looked at the numbers. We, we This is one piece of it. So you're absolutely right. And I think that's what people need to focus on is we have a lot more need than we are even going for this money. But can you imagine going for 200 million? One, I, we don't have the capacity. I already checked that. We didn't have it from the beginning because I, you know, I knew the need. But I think that's an important piece of this that we don't want to miss. And it's a, it's a good comment you're making because we don't want to just say, oh, we excluded dollars. But I wanted to make one last point. 
when you're at this level of design, this standard square foot cost for a typical facility. So it really didn't matter whether that configuration changed. It really mattered on what the area square footage was of the facility. But I, without a doubt, even with the 89 million, you've seen the construction industry, and I'm sure SBA can attest to this, and my project managers, the escalation costs on construction, we're going to have to do some value engineering. Mm -hmm. No doubt. All right, next. Uh, How are we so doing? So the last two financial questions are similar to ones above, so we will capture that in the future. Uh, this is a question. What is needed from state legislators to get this on the ballot? When could a potential vote happen? So what was the first part? I'm sorry, I feel What is needed from state legislators? So it's from state legislators. So uh, Rep. Nore and I have already spoken, right? And we've talked about the process, what it would need to happen. First step is we need the support from the town side. The council needs to vote on a resolution that needs to go over to the house to be sponsored in, we have to write the legislation, right? So bond council has to help us write enabling legislation for us to go to ballot. So that is the process. The time frame would be November. I've stated to the building committee, I really wanna have the town council vote up or down prior to Thanksgiving. Over December, we'd be writing, we'd be kind of coordinating. When we get into session, I would ask that one of our representatives, maybe you Rep. Nora Doan as well, um, sponsor a bill that would do the enabling legislation to, for us to get the bond. It has to be passed, correct me if I'm wrong, by both sides, Senate and, so we'd be looking to our total legislative delegation to be supportive on that. And I'm sure in most cases, if there's a, a positive resolution that goes over, I don't know if I've ever seen a bond not be approved in the House or the Senate, but I'm sure there's one or two. So does that answer? And feel free to add anything. Everything that we've talked about. Okay. Mr. Clements. Sure. Just, uh, yeah. I, I guess, um, let me collect my thought here for a second. Sorry. So you mentioned the stage one proposal. Here's what our needs are. That was put in 2019 pre-COVID. Has there been any effort to reevaluate the needs based on COVID and what we've learned about learning in the pandemic? And I guess specifically towards uh, outdoor learning spaces and, and not having the need to purchase tents for some of the schools in the future. Um, and before you answer that, I'll just, I'll just make this comment, right? I grew up in a rural district. I rode on a diesel bus on dirt roads. I had a great school and that's what got me out of that community. So I would prefer better schools to roads. That's, that's my thought. That's really <laughs> Phil, you want to take that one? I mean, I... Well, if anything, the, the COVID experience has exposed the weakness in schools, right? Poor indoor air quality, uh, outdoor air dampers closed to save energy, when in reality, we need that open to bring in the fresh air. The fact that um, if we're going to be in remote learning uh, as an option with technology, having more than one outlet in a room is necessary. So really it has just supported all of the projects we're looking to do. Indoor air quality, MEP projects, and then giving those opportunities for smaller breakout spaces for an extension of the classroom and community learning. Because as they're finding out now that all these students are learning differently. And the pandemic has just sort of exaggerated all of those needs. It has not changed them. Just further uh, defined why you need them. Fair enough. 902. So that's my calling hour or what? Um, yeah, let's um, just while we have some state reps here. Um, how many towns and cities in Rhode Island have passed uh, or have approved the bond to go to voters and how many towns have actually approved? So I think on the board, one of the boards, we have 22 districts, I think, that are actually taking advantage, right? 20, right. right here. 22. Um, but recently, I know that actually Phil worked on Newport. That was 106 million, is that right? 106 Cranston passed theirs recently, which is 100. And, I don't know, Don, you're you're in. Yeah, I, I don't know the number. So we'll, well, actually, it's a great question. We'll get you a list. I'm sure the SBA could help with that um, of communities. But there are many communities at at much higher price tags, um, and it's not just areas like Barrington, where they did build a middle school, right? Um, and they had a much lower reimbursement rate, right? Because the base rate is 35%. We already start a little higher than many communities because it's based on our, our taxation income, tax capacity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's 
you know, one part of the equation, but we'll get you that list. Thank you. Um, now, I don't want to hold people hostage, so, um, <coughs> but I'll, I'll point to David Diagostino. Is there any preclusion on me continuing on? If I, you can, you can continue. What I would say is this, if you have to leave, feel free. Um, I'm willing to continue the discussion. I promise we won't go beyond 930 because I think we're all going to get burnt out. But um, I would like to address some of these questions, so I'll continue to. So, Phil, what's the next sure, one? Yeah. So, this one we already asked, uh, can we do a smaller amount and pass it this year? Right. Uh, design, is this middle school the Cadillac or is the Ford? So, I can tell you that um, this is not a Cadillac. This is, this is my idea. That's a good, good question. Uh, if you want, yeah, if you want a Cadillac, it's a Toyota car, Corolla. It's going to last this is, forever. This is what this is. These are the questions that we're going to get at a town council level as to what you know. When someone hears eighty-one million dollars, it's just it's unfathomable. So this this is this is a question I anticipate getting. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, Alita, Christine, you can weigh in on this because what are your average projects? I and mean, you're you're looking at these projects all the time. Yeah, I hate, I mean, again, not to sound insensitive to it, but $81 million in building construction now, it, it's sad that it really just does not go that far. Like the East Providence one, like I said, is 157, but that was from 2018. Uh, we're starting a project in Newport, right? Well, not right now, hopefully in the spring, if we um, stick with it. And that is about a 70 some odd million dollar tag. And, and again, people are already looking at compromising what they're going to get, but I, the process of value engineering, I hate to call it that, I call it more value management, because we are going to get the best for the $81 million that we can get. But um, it's really just from a construction standpoint, I just wish it went further. We should probably look at some schools and kind of get a feel for, for what it really does. I, I, I think that would be helpful from the, the marketing team. So because it, it, just your average citizen, myself, I can't even count to 81 million. So to, to have something to compare it to, we, we have to, we have to put something co uh, comparable for people to understand, even for, you know, ourselves on the council. So thank you. I think it's a great point. And, and we sometimes lose perspective, right? We, especially with the federal government, you know, we're going to give out a billion dollars and we, we don't even bat an eyelash right these days. So, but I think a lot of people at the local level really understand the value of 81 million, right? Yeah, I think the comparison to other school projects in the state of Rhode Island is just very good. That's a good idea. Um, we can talk to our folks at SBA to help us out. Well, certainly people in the building committee that are involved in some projects, projects that we are involved in. Um, I think that's a great idea. And, and Don, maybe we can get some, you know, through that we can get some comps. Like what did this school district do and what are their form and finishes, right? Yep. I think that, that would be extremely helpful. All right. Uh, will our pre-K be uh, warm, safe, and dry? So uh, the short answer is yes. And as Luke mentioned, the needs are great. They go beyond the $81 million. But certainly warm, safe, and dry is the minimum. That's the starting point. And, and one way, just so I can put this out there, you know, we could have caught all the other stuff other than the middle school out. But we didn't feel it was a responsible thing to do. We could have reduced the cost, right? I mean, it was it was pretty easy cut just to eliminate facilities. But the reason we're doing that is to do the extend, extension of life, to do those things that have to be done. And we realized that and we wanted to touch every school. Uh, what are the high school accreditation issues? Are we fixing those? Short answer, yes. We are fixing all of those issues. Um, and I won't get into them, but we can certainly dialogue after this meeting if you'd like. Why wasn't the high school auditorium considered for renovation and construction? Um, and I remember giving a presentation where I just showed the picture of a blender and next to it was a scale. And really what we needed to do was to take all of the needs that perhaps may have included the auditorium renovation at that time and maybe making sure that the pre-K is warm, safe and dry and, and put that all into the blender and start prioritizing those things. So I can tell you that making sure that the elementary schools are warm, safe, and dry was a higher priority than renovating the high school auditorium. But renovating the high school science labs 
was also higher than the high school auditorium. So this building committee deliver, debated, discussed, and made us work really hard to come up with that prioritization. That's why I feel very strongly about what I'm a part of presenting to you. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. And, and, you know, you make a good point. So I think we are allowed, correct me if I'm wrong, one scope change to the project, right? I think there's one time, is that correct? Once we're in? About one. Huh? About one. About one. Right, we'll go about one. So if somehow we overshot and we felt like we had so much money to not spend on the middle school, we could feasibly adjust course a little bit and put some more into other facilities or other options because we know there's much more need. So if there's a concern on that, we certainly could use the money. Um, but I can tell you, and Phil can attest from his experience, I, I don't get the sense that we're overshooting by any means. Next. Uh, what was the result of evaluating community support for the project overall, considering 70% of households in town do not have kids in the school system? So my mother is sitting in the crowd, right? Are you supportive? <laughs> and not because of me. I can tell you that because we disagree on all sorts of things. Believe me. Uh, my father, who's also a senior in the community, agrees with this project. They've been in the community all my life. They understand the value that this would bring. We've had these discussions, but they're always hard discussions because they include money. Don't mix money and family, right? But these are the discussions we're going to have to have over and over and over again over the next several months if we're going to move it forward. And I think if people see the value, some will, some won't. If you're money driven, then you probably won't see the value in anything. Those are probably the same people who will not vote for a budget because they don't see the value in plowing the roads, paying for police officers, paying for all the other things that municipal services provide. We need to encourage those that do value those things to support. Um, we're a community, it's a democracy, that's just how it works. So my hope is that out of those 70%, we will get some people who value our students, value our facilities, value our community, and choose to make the hard decision, which is give up Netflix. And I can tell you, I would never give up Netflix. Just wouldn't have. Or Disney Plus, right? And in fairness, people might not be giving up luxury items like right. that. But I will say, I have a fifth grader and a seventh grader right now. They're not going to this middle school. So even those of us with kids are kind of planting seeds for trees we'll never sit under. Um, they might get some of the bonuses from the high school, but that's not really what I'm basing the decision on myself um, as either a town council member or a resident. Um, good schools in your community mean a less expensive police force is more the reason I would do it. Um, and as a Charaho graduate, Charaho is on double sessions, not accredited. They built a middle school, um, which changed their town, I think more than it would change Coventry, but it changed the trajectory of the town I'm from in such a way that Cherahoe has now outgrown its new middle school. So just something to think about. New middle school at 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> it's still newer than ours. Right? That's right. That's right. So. Uh, last three questions. And uh, does the school building authority approve building plans regardless of the town's proven ability to pay them? Or is it solely based on just construction, not budget? Or do you want to... Dr. DeSilva? I mean, as part of the stage two application, Coventry demonstrated that they could issue this bond and, and support it. So one of the requirements is demonstrating that, which was already demonstrated in that application. And, and you know, it, it's difficult because many of us were here for a couple of years. Some of us are newer. But many of these discussions, the difficult thing from where I sit is I remember a lot of discussions with previous councils previous administration, previous parties who are no longer here. So these decisions are made over time. And unfortunately, I'm trying to catch everybody up, right? To a lot of people who are new of the early process. So um, yes, it is something that we had gone over, we had presented schedules, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, and as I think the treasurer aptly pointed out, every community is different. What's right for them is not a what levied by the state. So the approval doesn't necessarily mean that the Coventry has to move forward. It means they feel that we have the capacity to move forward 
from their aspects of the equation. Last two, um, what is the communications plan for awareness and public buy-in on the bond and overall project? So I'll speak first and then Don can take this as the marketing team leader. Um, we've talked about this extensively as a committee, right? And this has been something that was discussed from day one. We need to get the word out. Like We don't even have a project yet. We're gonna get the word on what? We've strategically held off on putting the word out because we know that dropping this too early would leave too many questions that we can't answer. Now we have very few questions that we can't answer, right? So by rolling this out in one fell swoop, which was strategic, we can really have a lot of the answers that the public desires. And so we have thought about that. And so Don, you have a team. What is that team doing? Right, so we, we looked at this as being the kickoff event to kick off the communication uh, strategy for this. Uh, we know that we have a few marks that we have to hit. One of the first ones obviously is getting town support and town council support so that we could then get a vote eventually. So our initial plan is to communicate information. It's not about telling people how to vote. It's not about convincing people to do something that they may not be comfortable with yet. It's just information. This is the project. This is the scope of the project. This is the cost of the project. This is what we're doing. And we're building out a few different things. I mean, we're, we're, we're working on logos. We're looking on slogans. We're working on um, a, a, a communication strategy that includes, like I said earlier, social media and uh, you know, robocalls and emails and you know, interviews on the radio. I mean, there's lots of components. But our strategy from now until November or October, whenever the town council will take this, is for us to just try to give people as much information as we possibly can about what this project is. So all of the boards are here are also PDFs. So all the boards that are here can be part of what we put on our website, what we email out to people, what we put on social media. Um, we are going to use opportunities to inform the community at open house. We're gonna use opportunities to inform the community at football games through PA announcements and stands. We're gonna use any opportunity we can just get in front of people so they can hear about the project. Thanks, Don. And, and you know, the last thing I'll say on that is we realize the importance of communication and clear communication, concise communication. So you've seen what we've done tonight. And to, to Phil's team's credit, they've really come through on this, right? Not everyone comes with a model day one, right? <laughs> this guy did. Um, and the reason is that to that point, I urge you to share it. You're all like, well, most of you are elected officials. Many of you are elected officials, right? Share this information with your constituents. There's no harm in that. Everything, I want to be open. We want to be honest, right? Not looking, looking to dupe anybody. So um, somebody's always going to have a comment, but I think it's a great litmus test for especially the council members to kind of gauge the response. It could be negative, maybe positive. I don't know. Ms. Lima. Um, I might recommend... Um, having some opportunities for people to just walk through that middle school. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it for myself, just how bad it was. And Mr. Lucian can attest, like my eyes were filled up that whole walk. And I almost cried my butt because that was, that was, it was shameful to see the poor condition of that school. And, so, I, and this is, and I also point this out there before I go outside my tires are slashed for making <laughs> comments about the financial impact. Um, I, I, it was, it was hard to, to walk through that. Uh, so I, I think that should be part of the marketing or communication strategy moving forward is visual and people being in there themselves because people's idea of this is in rough shape is different in everyone's mind. But when you walk people through, it puts it at a level playing field. So I, I'd like to just really quickly um, add this because I, I think that uh, piggyback off of your uh, comments. Um, first of all, our custodians, Jay Martin and everybody have been doing a wonderful above um, any means that anybody can ask them to keep what we have in the condition that we have it and make it the best we can. So I want to say that, yes, but there, take there are things, as anything right, your custodian. there are things, it. there are things like, um, mold inside of ventilations that we can't get rid of. There's mold in floors that we can't get rid of, humidity problems that we can't get rid of, um, 
just like said before, um, we have a lot of rooms that we just don't have the space for people and not just for just the class sizes that we have, how the shape of the classrooms are because it was many different facilities before just the middle school. Um, floors that are breaking apart because they just uh, cemented over um, beams, metal beams that are now rusting apart. Um, splicing schools together um, or walkways where we have ramps. Um, and when Jay was talking about the lunches, it's over two football fields that people have to cook lunches and wheel them down carts, down hallways with kids to bring them up to the lunchrooms. The lunchrooms have no windows inside of them um, that lead to any exterior light or anything. The ceilings are low, um, lower than what we have right here inside this room because of the fact that it was once a sunken in two sunken in rooms that are now rooms that are filled up to the top. Um, we are trying everything we can to do with, with our, our um, ventilation to keep it so that we don't get mold inside the rooms. Um, and constantly we have dehumidifiers that run uh, throughout the night that will fill up a 55 gallon barrel in some sections within a maybe 12, 14 hour period of time. So please come walk and, and I encourage anybody um, to, to get in touch with, um, you know, our school committee or, or our, our, our superintendent. And I would love because I have walk and talks when, when um, you know, obviously COVID situations, but to come in to see our building um, and see what we have to deal with when we have leaks uh, from the roof that are leaking that we try to keep repairing, but yet they keep um, you know, uh, the, the, the water keeps coming in where it, because the roof cracks, it's old. Um, or when we have water running inside all the electrical outlets and the, uh, the, the lights that are inside the building itself or running down the hallway um, and literally where you could slip and slide down the hallways. Um, kids that fall on the ground because the, the moisture gets so wet inside. And I encourage everybody, it, it's, we're doing the best we can to contain it to paint it, to make it look good. Um, but it is really a need that people need to come see in order to understand the, the depth of why this is the main project. And uh, I was there two years ago when the rain was just pouring in the roof. That was when I, really, yeah. yeah, just like incredible. So you made an ask, I'm the building committee chair. I'll commit to you that we will have a walkthrough. We'll schedule it soon to, to have the community involved. We'll try to do it at a time that's convenient, like on a Saturday or something. On a cold day that nobody wants to be outside and doing other things, right? This is A. If I could add to Mr. Lucian's, I'm the former principal at Western Coventry, and um, I've been there for the past 18 years. And last summer, um, in, in Coventry, as a, a, a member of the teaching staff and administration for 33 years, I served on this committee because I love the community and I want what's best for our kiddos. Um, Mr. Murray visited as the Town Council, I mean, the school committee person visited Western Coventry last summer. I want to compliment Mr. Martin, but also the teachers. Mr. Murray had never been in the school in the summer. And so he walked the building with me last summer, pre coming back from, um, you know, coming back from COVID. And he said, I can't believe what I see here. Like, uh, and the community members of Western Coventry love the school and they love the way it looks and the feel of it. It's an old school. Um, it has a ton of character to it, but when you actually see what teachers are covering up and whatnot, um, it's amazing the amount of work. So when you say, let's get rid of part of the project, how do you say we're going to leave an elevator that is not accessible to students with disabilities? It's an elevator that has a graded um, door that if a child stuck their hand in that was going up the elevator, it, it's unsafe. It was built in the 40s. Um, how do we do those kinds of things as a community and leave those things the way they are and say, we can't afford this. We can't afford not to do this. Just wanted to bring hey, that character up. is another, I just funny you mentioned character. Character is another room word for work. My house has character and I've been working on it for 15 years. <laughs> so, all right, Phil. Last uh, question, it's, it's more of a statement and it probably um, really defines why we even had this meeting tonight because it is the beginning and uh, not all the options and information has been able to be shared. That's why you ended with next steps as being collaboration. Uh, but the comment is, while the stages were unanimously approved by school committee and town council, this was not to continue the process 
or I'm sorry, this was to continue the process, not an approval of cost funding options. Not really a question, mm -hmm. but I would agree. Yeah. You know, it, and we've never said it was an approval, mm -hmm. right? So I think we accept it, we move on, right? So you're absolutely right. The next steps matter. We have a lot of work to do. So, and it's very late. So I appreciate you all staying. Again, I'll continue to stay if you have any other questions. But. Rep Nardone. It's okay. Our cost overages built into the budget. Surely you jest. No. Uh, I don't believe they are. So we do have a, a contingency. Oh, you have a contingency, yeah. yes. So the SBA does not provide a contingency for you, but our estimates that we did in house through, uh, and actually, just a note, Phil. We had a professional cost estimator beyond your team as well. Sure, is that correct. Sure, independent, They're independent cost yeah. that is required by RAI. So, so that estimate has contingency or float built into it. Um, do you remember what the float was on that? So, it's typically fifteen to twenty percent. Around ten. I mean, there's industry standards on that. I don't know. The initial estimate at this stage would have had a design contingency and a construction contingency separately. So one for finishing up pieces of the design and then the construction for, you know, buyout and, and, and cost increases and such like that. So they kind of divide it this early in the game. And I ask Alita because she actually reviewed the estimate for me. There is a plan. That's a short answer. That's what all you really wanted, right? <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Again, we'll be sticking around a little bit longer. We so. have to oh, that's right. <laughs> Formal meeting. So I will uh, ask that we adjourn our meeting at the school building committee at 924. So motion. Right. Yep. Right. I'm going to adjourn the school building first. So. Okay, hold on. I'll make a motion to adjourn the school building committee. I second. Alito Hall second in the motion. I see a hand up. Want to do a hand vote? All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay. Motion passes. I would ask that uh, Chairwoman Patnaud adjourn her meeting. Um, I'd like to adjourn. Can we have a motion to adjourn the school committee meeting? Make a motion to adjourn the school committee meeting. I second. Um, we can have a raised hand vote. Both here. All right. Just Gloria. Yep. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. May have a motion by a member of the town council to adjourn. I'll, I'd like to make a motion, but only after we thank the chairman and the school building committee for a very informative night. And thank you very much for walking us through this process. Thank you, Luke. I'll make the motion. May, may I have a Thank you. May I have a second? I'll second the motion. Thank you. Roll call vote. Mrs. Ludwig? Ms. Ludwig? Yes. Mrs. Shockley? Yes. Mrs. Lima? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. Dixon? Five yeas, no nays. The motion passes. The meeting is adjourned at 